Hi everyone, in this video we're going to talk a little bit about pair production, which is this process in which a photon produces a particle-antiparticle pair. Now one of the interesting things about pair production is that it can't actually happen in exactly the way that I've sketched out in my diagram uh, up at the top here. In particular, there's a missing particle and it turns out that you need some other particle nearby in order for this process to be allowed to happen. So in this video we are going to explore why this extra particle is actually necessary. Now we're going to begin our analysis by transforming into a frame of reference which is particularly convenient to work in. In particular, it is the zero momentum frame of the particle-antiparticle pair. It's perfectly okay to do this and just choose to work in whichever frame we'd like to because whether a process happens or not shouldn't really be something that depends on the frame um, from which we look at it. I suppose when we get special relativity involved uh, pair production might occur at different times in different frames but it wouldn't really make any sense to say that pair production happens in one frame but just doesn't happen at all in the other frame that would be inconsistent. So anyway in this zero momentum frame the particle and its antiparticle uh, must of course have equal and opposite momenta. We're not considering the momentum of the photon when we try to transform to our zero momentum frame, we're specifically just requiring the particle-antiparticle pair um, to have a momentum that sums up to zero. So you've got p in one direction which is just arbitrary and minus p in the opposite direction. Both particles have a mass of m because it's a particle and its corresponding antiparticle, they always have the same mass, and we're going to say that in this particular frame uh, the photon has energy e ph. So we're going to approach this by constructing a equations for conservation of energy and conservation of momentum and exploring the consequences of those. So if we do conservation of energy first, well at the beginning of the process you only have a photon, you don't have any particles, and so the energy that you've got is just EPH. Now that is going to be completely converted into the energy of the particle-antiparticle pair. Now let's do this relativistically um, and say that the total energy of any particle is gamma mc squared, where gamma is the relativistic factor 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where v is the speed. Now of course the antiparticle has the same mass as the particle and it's going at the same speed because we're in the zero momentum frame and therefore the total energy afterwards is just going to be 2 times gamma mc squared. So there's nothing wrong with that so far, right? That's just saying that the photon has to be able to provide enough energy to create the particles and to get them moving um, with whatever speed they happen to be moving at. So what about conservation of momentum? Well, the initial momentum is just the momentum of the photon. So let's say P, pH, momentum of the photon. The final momentum is in fact zero because we're working in the zero momentum frame of the particle-antiparticle pair. It's just P minus P. Now you might already be thinking it's not possible for a photon to have zero momentum and therefore we have a problem, which is true, but let's just make it really explicitly clear why exactly this is a problem. So what I'm going to do is take the magnitude of each side of this vector equation and then multiply it by the speed of light as well. The magnitude of the photon momentum multiplied by the speed of light is just zero, and then the significance of the left-hand side here is that photons are supposed to obey the relationship energy equals momentum times c, or energy equals magnitude of momentum times c. So if this equation is true, right, if magnitude of p ph times c is zero, that implies that the energy of the photon would also have to be zero. So then of course we have this equation saying the energy of the photon is 2 gamma mc squared, and this equation saying the energy of the photon is zero, and we've got two things that are clearly inconsistent with each other. 2 gamma mc squared definitely can't be equal to zero because, well, c squared is positive, mass is always positive, and gamma is always at least one, and so there's no way that 2 gamma mc squared can be zero. So our conclusion is that the process we've been describing cannot actually happen because it can't satisfy conservation of both energy and momentum at the same time. Now as I sort of alluded to earlier, the solution to this is that there needs to be some other particle nearby for the photon to interact with. Um, so I've just added some some other particle there, let's call it particle x, and it's got some arbitrary momentum px and some arbitrary energy ex in the zero momentum frame of the particle-antiparticle pair. Let's repeat the same analysis, do conservation of energy and momentum with that extra particle and see um, how this allows the process to happen. So conservation of energy, the equation is going to be pretty similar just with one extra term on each side. So initially you've got the photon energy but you also have the initial energy of particle x, so let's call that E x i, initial energy of x. Um, afterwards, after the uh, pair production has happened, you've still got your 2 gamma mc squared, the energy of the particle-antiparticle pair, but the particle x, this extra particle, is also going to have some energy um, 
after the interaction has happened, and so let's just call that e x comma f final energy of particle x. This can be rearranged um, for e p h just to get two gamma m c squared, and then it's going to be the final energy of x minus the initial energy of x. So let's just call that plus delta. Uh, the energy of x. Our main problem though is with the conservation of momentum equation previously, so let's set that one up and see what happens now. You're still going to have some initial photon momentum, but now particle x also has some initial momentum, so let's call that Pxi. Um, after the pair production has occurred, the particle antiparticle pair has zero momentum overall because of the frame that we're choosing to work in. But the difference now is that particle X is still going to have some other momentum right after the interaction has taken place. And so we can rearrange that to get momentum of the photon um, is just zero plus the change in the momentum of particle X. Now remember that the energy of the photon is the speed of light times the magnitude of the momentum of the photon, right? E equals PC. And this equation therefore implies that the energy of the photon needs to be equal to just modulus of delta px multiplied by c. So then we've got two equations for photon energy, this one and this one, and because you've introduced these extra degrees of freedom in delta ex and delta px, uh, we can find possible solutions to this system of equations, and therefore the process can happen provided this particle x is around. Now when we say that solutions exist, bear in mind that what that really means is that there are many possible different outcomes of this process. For example, this gamma parameter, the relativistic gamma that depends on how fast the particle and its antiparticle are going, um, is not known. We can't find a unique value for that using the system of equations that we've got. But the idea is that because we've introduced extra degrees of freedom, extra parameters, delta EX and delta PX, for a particular value of gamma, we can find values of delta EX and delta PX that will make the system of equations work out. You may be wondering if for a given set of initial conditions, it's possible to predict exactly what state the particles at the end will be in. And uh, the answer is no, because this is a quantum mechanical process and therefore it's inherently probabilistic. What you can do is a full quantum mechanical calculation and find the differential cross section for various different outcomes to occur, um, but that's much, much more involved than what we're doing here. Anyway, so the conclusion is basically that you need particle X around in order that it can absorb the momentum from the photon and allow momentum and energy to both be conserved. In terms of what particle X actually is, well, it could really be anything. Um, it's often a nucleus in practice. I think the reason for this is just because nuclei have large charges compared with individual subatomic particles. And this is an interaction that's governed by the electromagnetic force and things with higher charges have a higher probability of interacting electromagnetically. So that's why you may have heard it said before that pair production only happens near a nucleus. Anyway, I think that's all for now. Thank you for watching and see you again soon.